We don't know exactly when uh, regular schools, that is, state-run schools, first appeared. Plutarco says they were founded around 250 BC, and that means approximately 500 years after the founding of the city. Until then, Roman children were homeschooled, the poorest by their parents, the richest by magistri, teachers chosen usually among the liberti, the freed slaves, which in turn were chosen among the prisoners of war, preferably Greeks as they were the most uh, learned. We know for sure that they had less to study than today. For one thing, they already spoke Latin. If they had to study Latin, as the German poet Hein said, they wouldn't have found the time to conquer the world. As for history, this is more or less what they were taught. When the Greeks Menelaus, Ulysses and Achilles conquered Troy and erased it, one of the few defenders who saved himself was Aeneas, strongly favoured by his mother, none less than Venus Aphrodite. As he wandered the world after a few years of adventures, he reached Italy, sailed northwards and reached Lazio. He married the daughter of uh, King Latino, whose name was Lavinia, and founded a city named after his wife, where he lived out his life with her. His son Ascanio founded Alba Longa, making it the new capital city, and after eight generations, two of his descendants, Nomitore and Amulio, were still on the throne of Lazio. Unfortunately, the throne was a bit tight for two kings, so one day Amulio kicked his brother out to reign by himself and killed all of his children except one daughter, Rea Silvia. To avoid her giving birth to any child that might want to avenge his grandfather, he forced her to become a priestess of the goddess Vesta, which in modern terms pretty much means she became a nun. One day, Rea, who probably was sitting next to the river, enjoying the coolness of the shade on a hot summer day, she fell asleep. The god Mars, who often came down to earth to have a bit of fun, be it in a war or with some women, happened to pass by. He saw Rea Silvia and fell in love with her, without even waking her up, got her pregnant. When Amulio came to know this, he became furious, but he didn't kill her. He waited for her to give birth, which happened to be twins. He loaded the twins on a minuscule raft and entrusted their destruction to the river, confident they would have drowned. The wind, though, pushed the raft towards the shore, further downstream, where the two infants were found by a she-wolf, who started nursing them. That is how the wolf became the symbol of the city that was founded by those two infants. The malicious said that it wasn't a natural wolf, but a woman that found the children, Acca Larentia, called the wolf because of her wild nature and the frequent cheating on her husband with any young man that passed by. It could easily just be gossip though. The twins grew up and were named Romolo the one and Remo the other. Soon they came to learn their past, they returned to Alba Longa, organized a revolt, and after killing Amulio, they put their grandfather Numitori back on the throne. Once this was done, they started getting impatient, and instead of waiting to inherit the reign from their grandfather, they went off to found a brand new one, choosing the spot where their raft beached itself, saving their lives. As it often happens, the two brothers argued on the name of the city, and decided that the one that would see the most birds would win and name the city. Remo on the Aventino saw six, while Romolo on the Palatino saw twelve. The city would then be named Roma. They yoked two white oxen, ploughed the furrow, and raised the walls, swearing that they'd kill anyone that would breach them. Remo, still resenting his loss, said the walls were fragile, and kicked off a piece to prove his point. Romolo, true to his oath, grabbed a spade and killed him on the spot. All of this supposedly happened 753 years before Christ, exactly on the 21st of April, which is still celebrated as the city's birthday. Its inhabitants counted it as the beginning of the history of the world until Christianity imposed another year one. Probably the nearby populations did the same, starting the count of the years from the founding of their capital city, Alba Longa, Rieti, Tarquinia, or whichever we may look at. They didn't get to have it recognized though, because they committed the small mistake of losing the war, or more correctly, the wars. Rome won them instead. 
The field that measured a few acres that Romolo and Remo cut with their plough became in a few centuries the centre of Lazio, then of Italy, and then of all the lands then known, and in all the lands then known, the Roman language was spoken, Roman law was enforced, and the years were counted ab urbe condita, from the 21st of April, 753 BC, when the history and civilization of Rome started. Of course, things didn't go exactly that way, but this is how Roman fathers wanted to narrate the origins of the city, partly because they believed it themselves, well, a bit at least, and partly because, as patriots, it flattered them to mix important gods such as Mars and Venus, and big names like Aeneas with the birth of the Urbe. They believed it was important to indoctrinate their children with the belief that they belonged to a country built with the intervention of supernatural beings and destined for greatness. That gave a religious basis to all life in Rome, which coincidentally collapsed when this basis was no more. The Urbe was Caput Mundi, capital of the world, as long as its citizens knew little and were naive enough to believe in those legends that their fathers taught them, as long as they believed to be descendants of Aeneas and that they had the divine blood in their veins, as long as they believed that they were the anointed of the gods. It was when they started to doubt such things that the empire collapsed and that Caput Mundi became a colony. Let's not get ahead of ourselves though. In the fable of Romolo and Remo, there might be some truth. Let's see what we can extract from what archaeology and ethnology can tell us. Going back to around 8,000 years ago, the land was populated by the Liguri in the north and by the Sicoli in the south. There were a population who lived in caves and mud huts, who had started taming animals and lived mainly of uh, hunting and fishing. Skipping 4,000 years ahead, approximately 2000 BC, we start to see more tribes crossing the Alps. They are not much more advanced than the locals, but they have the habit of building their huts on stilts and settle in the marshy areas around the lakes in northern Italy, bringing with them the innovation of keeping flocks of sheep, cultivating the land, weaving fabrics and defending their villages with bastions of mud. Slowly they move southwards and they learn to build their huts also on dry land, but still on top of stilts. They learn to forge iron, and eventually founded what could be called a city, Villanova, which was close to where Bologna is now. This was the centre of a culture called Villanovian, which slowly spread in all of the peninsula. It most probably originated as an ethnicity, language and tradition, the Umbri, the Sabini and the Latini. What happened to the indigenous Liguri and the Sicoli is unknown. Maybe they were exterminated, as it was so common at the time, or maybe they were absorbed into the Villanovians after being conquered. Whatever did happen, by the time we reach 1000 BC, the newcomers founded many villages in central Italy, which were always in a state of hostility with each other, and often in a state of war, even if they were essentially the same people. The largest and most powerful of these uh, cities was Alba Longa, capital of Lazio, at the foot of Mount Albano, which more or less corresponds to modern-day Castel Gandolfo. It is thought that from that city came the group of men who emigrated a few kilometers north and founded Rome. Maybe they were farmhands looking for some land to call their own. Maybe they were escaping the law. Maybe they were sent to establish a garrison to keep an eye on a new population that had started settling in Tuscany, the Etruscans, whose origins were unknown but already didn't have a good reputation. It is even possible that among these pioneers were really uh, two called Romolo and Remo. In any case, it is doubtful that there were more than a hundred or so. The site they chose had both advantages and disadvantages. It was about 20 kilometers from the sea, and that was fine as a protection from pirates that infested it. But they didn't have to relinquish the idea of a port because the river was navigable, especially for the boats of the time. On the other hand, the marshes that surrounded them brought malaria, a sickness that Rome has had to contend with until quite recently. There were the hills though, which in part protected from the mosquitoes. And it was on one of these hills, the Palatino, 
that they first settled, with the intention of settling the other six that were nearby. To settle them, though, you need people. And to make people, you need wives. And those pioneers were all single. In the absence of historical reference here, we have to turn back to legend, which tells us how the leader of these settlers, whether his name was Romulo or not, procured some women for his men. He organized a great party, possibly under the pretense of celebrating the birth of the city, and he invited his neighbors, the Sabini, and their king, Tito Tazio, and most importantly, their daughters. The Sabini came, but while they were intent on partying and competing in games, the hosts took the girls and kicked them out. At that time, they were very sensitive in matters of women. Not too long ago, the kidnapping of Elena caused a war that lasted ten years and the raising of the civilization of Troy. The Romans had kidnapped dozens, so it's quite natural that their fathers and brothers took up arms to rescue them. They camped on the Campidoglio, another of the hills, but they made the mistake of giving the keys of their fortress to Tarpeia, a Roman girl who had fallen in love with Tito Tazio. She opened the door to the invaders, who in turn squashed her under their shields for being a traitor, even if it was in their favour. The Romans later called Tarpeia the cliff from which traitors were cast off as a death sentence. Everything ended in a wedding feast, because while the Romans and the Sabini were fighting, the women intervened and declared they didn't want to become orphans in case of Roman victory, or widows in case of Sabine victory. Life with the new husbands was not so bad, so might as well make the whole thing official. That is how Romolo and Tazio decided to share the throne, both as kings, and the new population, born of the fusion, were finally really called Romani, Romans. And since Tazio did the courtesy of dying soon after, this case of two kings for a throne worked just fine. Who knows what is actually behind the story? But maybe it's just the version of a Sabine conquest of Rome, fueled by patriotism and pride. But it is entirely possible that the two populations did voluntarily mix, and the famous kidnapping was just part of the wedding ceremony of the time, with a fake kidnapping of the bride on part of the groom, but with the consent of her father as it is done still in some primitive populations. If this is the case, it is likely that this fusion was imposed by the danger posed by a common enemy, those Etruscans, who in the meantime from the coast had spread inland in Tuscany and Umbria, and armed of a much more advanced technology, were pressing south. Rome and Sabina were straight ahead of this march and under direct threat. And in fact, they couldn't avoid it. The Urube was just born, and already it had to face one of its most difficult and insidious rivals of its history. The Etruscans were defeated through feats of diplomacy first, and bravery and tenacity later, but it took Rome centuries to achieve that defeat. <laughs>